Afrique Média. Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. In the global world at large, the military has always represented an institutional, that institution that protects the interests of a country, especially from external threats. The 21st century has taken a different twist in Africa as the military has taken another stage in what can be termed a new revolution in Africa's political stage. Africa has experienced about eight schools in recent times, uh, that is uh, in Gabon, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Conakry, Sudan, among others, surprisingly increasing civic engagement, especially among vibrant youths calling for political reforms in every dimension. These recent schools in Africa have undoubtedly sent shockwaves through the political sphere influencing the continent's political landscape in a significant and far-searching or far-reaching ways, these coup d'etats have uh, challenged, however, long-standing government, disrupted power dynamics, and triggered broader conversation about democratic governance and political transitions across Africa. So today's debate, the Pan-African debate, provides us with an opportunity to delve into the complexities surrounding coup d'etat in uh, Africa and their impact on uh, Africa's uh, uh, political uh, landscape. Uh, this is the Pan-African debate. You are most welcome. Recent uh, coup d'etat in Africa, is it reshaping the Africa's political scene or sphere? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once more for making out time to be with us today. It is uh, pan, uh, the Pan-African debate, the first for the month of September 2023. And today we are looking at very two crucial topics, of course, uh, starting with what is making waves across Africa with the recent coup d'etat in Gabon and what is unveiling already in Niger and other countries in Africa that have witnessed uh, uh, military takeovers. We want to analyze to a greater extent the impact of this military coup in, uh, coups in Africa and also see if it is reshaping the African political landscape and if be the case, how can it be done now to the extent that it will not further jeopardize the peace and stability or even challenge the democracy that is already existing across Africa. Just to note that in the course of the program, we'll also be analyzing uh, the regional elections that uh, Russia will be holding in the new regions, uh, uh, the four occupied uh, regions. We're looking at the impact of these regional elections and how it will go a long way to change, uh, of course, uh, how uh, things are being run in, in the, these uh, regions. We're talking about Donex, we're talking about uh, uh, Logan, we're talking about Kherson, and of course, uh, we'll be discussing it in the course of the uh, program. And uh, there are actually key areas uh, as far as the coup d'etat in Africa is concerned concern key points that we will accentuate on in the course of the program like uh, contextualizing coup d'etat and of course uh, taking p uh, particular coup d'etat that have uh, occurred in Africa in recent times we want to look at uh, the causes and motivation especially of the 21st century coup d'etat we we'll also look at uh, in a greater extent to see if uh, this coup d'etat uh, in present uh, society uh, are necessary to redefine Africa's political scene. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. If you are just tuning in, you are most uh, welcome. Time for us to uncover the panel of experts, the great panel that will give us a total provoking analysis 
uh, to go a long way to analyze constructively, uh, I always reiterate constructively, uh, the, the happenings around Africa's uh, political atmosphere and see the way forward as far as military uh, takeovers are concerned in Africa. Let's take you now uh, to the United States of America. Uh, we're going to welcome uh, uh, Dr. A.D. Eric, who is joining us uh, today uh, in his capacity as program officer at the Solidarity Center for uh, Africa uh, Development. Hello to you, Dr. A.D. It's a pleasure having you this day. Thank you, Clarice. It's always for me uh, a pleasure to uh, attend, participate in this uh, show uh, with my uh, esteemed colleagues as well, and I say hi to them. Happy weekend. Respecting this uh, rendezvous, Dr. Eddy, uh, let us also acknowledge the presence of uh, Mr. Arnold Devlin in his capacity as a political consultant. Of course, uh, uh, we are most delighted to have you again on the Pan-African debate, Mr. Devlin, and looking forward to having an engaging uh, uh, debate with you. Good day to everybody. Thank you for having me, Clarice. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, too, for making up time to be with Africa Media this day, Mr. Davley. And uh, we're acknowledging Mr. Clinton Ellis, who is a geopolitical strategist and also an electrical power engineer. He's joining us, sure, from the United Kingdom. You're most welcome to the Pan-African debate, sir. Thank you, Clarice. I wouldn't miss it for the world. It's always a pleasure. And... Uh, Finally, let's uh, welcome Mr. Elijah Enoko, researcher with Leeds University on African development. Thanks for making out time for us this day, sir. Uh, thanks for having me one more time, Clarice, and uh, hopefully we're going to have uh, a fruitful discussion this uh, afternoon where you are and morning where I am and um, be able to talk about the things that are happening on a beautiful continent of Africa. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure having you all. Just to remind us of that, uh, Yulia Burke, a political scientist, will be joining us in the course of, of the program. And if you are just tuning in, this is uh, the Pan-African debate on Africa media television. Uh, uh, the recent military takeovers in Africa reshaping the Africa's political landscape in uh, contemporary society. That is our bond of contention today. Uh, but of course, as tradition, I would always like us to give a holistic perspective of what is happening, taking the most recent of it all. Uh, we saw what happened in Gabon after the uh, August 26th presidential election. We saw the military overwhelming the, the, the president and of course, uh, the declaration of being in control, wanting to uh, be in control to reinstate uh, institutions. So we want to analyze, uh, let's kick start uh, with you, uh, Dr. Eddie Eric. We are looking at a recent coup d'etat in Africa and bringing it to, to this uh, very uh, problematic, how it's affecting Africa's uh, political scene. But first of all, let's contextualize the military takeovers in the 21st century. Amazingly, uh, Clarice, uh, maybe we want to look at uh, the late uh, 20th century by uh, the 1990s, when uh, most of the African countries decided the following uh, social upheaval, starting in uh, Benin, for instance, in 1989, which uh, was uh, joined, you know, by or instrument, uh, instrumented, I'm sorry, by uh, different unions, you know, or the social forces, as we say, to bring what we call the uh, second wave of a democracy. What is important even here to note is that after so many years of either one party rule in so many countries, especially the French uh, speaking countries or countries that were under former, uh, under, uh, under colonial, uh, French colonial rule, there was this desire by populations that so were gain more space right, in terms of their political and civil rights. It was also the time when people like, you know, Basil Davidson, uh, Voltaire, those era, they lost a decade, you know, with the 1970s to the 1980s, when uh, African economies, you know, were, were uh, really not moving. The point in it here I'm trying to make is, we uh, ended the 20th century with high hopes, 
right, with all of these movements by reshaping again, you know, what the uh, political institutions. We remember it was the decades when uh, African countries, the people, you know, were voters, citizens, you know, were decided and agreed. Uh, one reason or another to uh, reshape their constitutions, put a name to this uh, long uh, ru uh, ruling, you know, uh, head of states who were all, you know, were blamed for the uh, political and economic, you know, uh, lethargy in which uh, the African countries were. At the same time that those happen within the respective African countries, we also saw that, you know, where regional economic uh, bodies moved to being simple economic, you know, where bodies, I'm talking about the ECOWAS, the uh, CEA, uh, CEAC, and many others of those uh, uh, institutions to become not just economic instruments, but also political instruments. We have seen it in the case of West Africa, for instance, when uh, Liberia descended into shambles with uh, the uh, civil war that broke out, you know, on December 24, 1980. The, uh, uh, nine that uh, the ECOMOG, for instance, was put into place. But the ECOMOG is a child or was under the uh, uh, ECOWAS. Point uh, to fast forward, all that, you know, were brought hope. And then we saw again uh, some uh, sort of uh, uh, elections in and there. Today, we can applaud what is happening in Benin, a country that has been uh, marked by uh, coup d'etat in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, that brought you know, a Marxist leader, Mathieu Kerekou. We saw what happened in Togo. We saw what happened in Burkina Faso. So there was this hope uh, that what we are witnessing today is uh, uh, with uh, Mali. Uh, in 2020 and then 2021, Burkina Faso, uh, recently Guinea in 2022, uh, Niger this year, 2023, and Gabon, you know, uh, happening. We will say, and my uh, comment is this, that, you know, number one, we are witnessing, you know, uh, a uh, regression of what the African populations desired uh, later in the 1990s for which student unions, uh, workers unions, and any other social forces you know, were worked uh, for to obtain strong, stable political institutions to guide the stability in those countries, but of course uh, to be the basis of a, uh, an economic development. What we are witnessing today means that uh, those desires were not met. Not only they were not met, but I believe that uh, we uh, moved in a direction that is uh, certainly worse than where we were probably in the 1990s. When you look at Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, especially these three countries of the Sahel, one of the big things that people are uh, 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 pushing for is uh, what we have a term as a terrorism, which I use the term uh, global uh, political violence, you know what to uh, des describe. In Guinea and uh, Gabon, as we see, it is another form of a political uh, coup that uh, have uh, coups that have uh, maimed those uh, two countries. We are talking about the longevity of uh, the uh, ruling elite in those countries. So my last word in uh, giving this picture is this, that, you know, what, what is it that, you know, people are desiring? Are we in the position to say that, you know, the African population in those countries are supporting political coup? I don't think so. What I believe is that the people are fed up and tired of weaver political system in place, tired of weaver ruling elite not being able to bring them the basic uh, and fundamental right that they need. And at this moment, like in the 1960s, 1970s, people will applaud any change that comes with the hope that it will create a, a foundation for a better future. And last example we can take for that one is the case of Nigeria. It may not be the best of the best, you know, with democracy of today, but remember, between the 19, the time when uh, 1985 up to uh, 1990s, I mean, you have at least uh, two good decades of Nigeria uh, being ruled by uh, military uh, leaders. But what happened? When General Abu Salami Abubakar took over in 1999 after uh, Sani Abasha died, he led a transition of only nine months. Nine months. That led to what we are, where we are today, Nigeria. Even if we have a former military rule that came and won election, that's what we want. 
and that's where Nigeria is at uh, the moment. So it is not perceived that people are uh, claiming, you know, we're military rulers. They are actually fed up uh, with a situation or a system that has been in place, which is not guaranteeing again conditions for people to work, condition for women uh, to have uh, access to uh, healthcare pre and postnatal care condition for young people to uh, benefit from uh, uh, what we can call you know what resources in their countries and this is my submission for uh, this first question amazing thank you so much uh, for that uh, dr eddie eric i'll continue the discourse uh, with you uh, mr arnold uh, dovely uh, we are today analyzing coup d'etat in africa and of course uh, uh, we are conversant of the fact that the world has greatly evolved and today we are looking at uh, coups in a more globalized uh, society uh, from your perspective as an international uh, political consultant uh, we want to have your own uh, perspective regarding the the recent coup d'etat in Africa, and of course, see if it's uh, the, the evolvement in the world that has le uh, led to a more globalized world uh, accounts for the reason why uh, there is. Because in our preamble, we highlighted the, the fact that more and more Africans have become uh, a civic consciousness, like uh, th they want us to actually be part of the total transformation of that country, like Dr. Eddy uh, highlighted, wanting to engage with the hope of seeing uh, a, a more positive transformation and a clear defined uh, democracy. So in your perspective, uh, what do you have to say regarding the latest uh, 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 development in Africa's political sphere, especially in the areas, uh, the area of military takeovers? Well, first of all, I think we, uh, should definitely take heed of what Dr. Edie said. Uh, those military takeover as such uh, might express first and foremost a desire to uh, see some change happening, but uh, change for uh, the sake of change, unless it is followed up by fundamental policies, which allow, uh, even if it's in a transition period, which sees uh, plurality of opinion being somewhat shoved aside, but if the policies themselves allow the population to uh, benefit more fully of their riches and to realign the uh, economic uh, uh, configurations that have thus far deprived uh, most of the African, at least the uh, Francophone Africa, of uh, the full share of the pie, uh, then this, those coup d'etat will be for nothing. And so on that respect, uh, I would say that uh, the jury is still out and we will have to see uh, to what extent we are witnessing a fundamental uh, earthquake in uh, the uh, regional uh, uh, power sharing power structures. Uh, I will only say that uh, what's interesting is that all the uh, recent uh, changes uh, in the countries that you've mentioned, i.e. Uh, Guinea, uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Mali, now Gabon, uh, we seem to be seeing somewhat of a, uh, a willingness to stick together and somewhat come to each other's uh, rescue to shore up uh, the uh, political changes uh, in case there would be somewhat of a reaction, you know, uh, which would aim to invalidate. I mean, I take it, for instance, that in Mali, we just found out that uh, a couple of days, or in uh, Niger, I should say, a couple of days after the uh, the, the recent coup, uh, there was it would seem an attempt to uh, coup the coup themselves. You know, so uh, obviously there's a lot of players behind the scenes who are angling uh, for control uh, through proxy, and uh, we have to be very cautious. Uh, we also have to be cautious about what we witnessed in the Middle East in the uh, early 2010s. Uh, with a, a lot of hopes that uh, uh, those uh, uh, regime change were from uh, coming from the uh, bottom up, when in fact it turned out that they were engineered from abroad, and it's what, it was just basically an issue of retooling uh, the facade so as to uh, put into place you know new faces which would basically pursue the same policies. So let us be uh, hopeful. Let us hope that uh, you know fundamental and. Deep, uh, stru deeply structured policies 
uh, will be implemented as a result of the recent political changes, which will allow the population to really get access to uh, prosperity and uh, development in a way that their uh, wealth would you know, allow them to. Uh, but uh, let's not be uh, let's not be you know uh, let's not go too fast in the analysis and uh, think uh, you know that this is uh, uh, pretty much over you know it's just the beginning now more, you know it's only the beginning and and obviously uh, uh, we are likely to see more changes taking place it seems to be a, a, a phenomenon that has taken a life on its own. I don't think Gabon, since we will talk about it, is the last domino to quote and of quote fall. And, uh, you know, in that respect, uh, uh, let's be cautious in, uh, you know, analyzing what uh, what is going on right now. Uh, it is very imperative to be conscious in analyzing uh, the political development across Africa right now to uh, actually uh, mitigate uh, the uh, consequences uh, like uh, you and Dr. Edia uh, already mentioned. Uh, could task with uh, the uh, intention of seeing practical and positive change in uh, respective nations, uh, it's actually uh, necessary. Uh, of course, uh, the viewpoint shared by you all. Let's continue with uh, Mr. Ellis. Uh, of course, he's a geopolitical strategist. And of course, when we talk about coup d'etat, we cannot just uh, keep it at the internal level. There is uh, the tendency to, to look at, at it from every dimension. And of course, uh, coming uh, to you, uh, Mr. Ellis, as a geopolitical strategist, can you uh, attest or what can you say about the, uh, the hike in the ge geopolitical uh, shift in Africa and the political revolution also witnessing itself in Africa and the end result being a coup d'etat. So what relation can we give to this and what is the way forward? Because I quite remember like the, the, the two other uh, panelists have underlined when there is uh, the, the civic engagement in political affairs and of course going to an extent of uh, embracing military uh, takeover, we can see on the streets of Gabon how the uh, the, the, the youthful population was actually jubilating uh, when the military overwhelmed the uh, incumbent, Ali Bongo. So now we want to analyze uh, this and, and see in your own perspective as a geopolitical analyst. What are those? Uh, thank uh, yeah, okay. Thanks, Clarice. Yes. Uh, thank you for, um, to the, to the panelists for um, elucidating um, so eloquently the current situation, at least at the very beginning. But I want to just connect my argument to Mr. Devil's argument in the sense that we do not know exactly what is happening right now. We, we, we see blood in the water and because of the frustration that is coming from the civilian population, um, their inability to benefit uh, from the resources of Africa, from you know, in terms of whether it's education or it is, um, you know, healthcare, or it is, you know, the ability to, um, you know, improve socioeconomically. We are seeing that there is this frustration and this frustration is all over Africa. The question that I would like to ask really is who are the puppet masters? Who are the puppet masters? Because generally there are typically lots of um, deals being brokered behind the scenes. Um, that would have initiated um, a certain degree of confidence on the part of the military for, for them to actually be able to work and operate in such a, a coordinated fashion. Um, where there is smoke, there is fire. And um, looking at the geopolitical chessboard, you know, I would say that um, there are external powers that are vying for influence in Africa. We talk about, you know, these things are happening throughout um, the Francophone, so-called Francophone Africa, um, where the French have had significant influence in these places you know going back decades and so now we have other parties like the russians who are coming in the chinese are coming in the americans are looking to re-strategize their position so that they could actually um also not lose the influence that they have in britain and the european union so we have all these parties um that are with significant um power and are able to influence and shape 
you know, what is happening behind the scenes. But let us look whenever their coup d'etats are very destabilizing to countries, you know, because you, you, you need to have civilian rule. And um, where there are coup d'etats, you know, you generally could have um, the risk of having another, uh, let's say, tyrant or someone that does not listen to the constitutional requests of the civilian population. Now, I want to say that um, let's break down the, the, the main parties inside of a country. You have the government, and there is typically the parliament, and then there is the executive. And the executive should be able to should, should change over political cycles. And of course, we know that in Africa, there are lots of, um, you would say, individuals that have been in power for a very long time, and they have been supported by external powers. So external powers that normally cry for democracy, they cry for democracy very conveniently if they do not have influence. But where they have influence, they typically are accepting the status quo. And wherever there are coup d'etats, they are a symptom of fundamental problems you know, that we need to look at. And of course, we mentioned about the, that the civilian population are unable to participate in the benefits of the development of Africa, especially now as we have the BRICS coming on, on the geopolitical chessboard, a, a significant piece, mm -hmm. where there are many, um, the Europeans are concerned about the BRICS, the Americans are concerned about the BRICS, and because they are, there is a transition from the Western powers into a new um, power structure that we're still waiting to see how it's going to actually look like. Um, now, I want to understand, does the militaries of these countries have any agenda pertaining to how they're going to transition back to civilian rule? This is something that I need to see on the table and that the people need to participate and to understand exactly what the agenda of the military leaders, what they do have right now. So we talked about the government making, being made up of the executive that should be there cyclically, then the parliament that should also be there cyclically then the judiciary that should actually be there to support the constitution um, of, of the country. The military, which is generally controlled by the executive. Obviously, there seems to be some you know, disagreement between these parties. And of course, we don't understand what is the straw that has broken the camel's back, because in many of these countries, we've had leaders there for quite some time. Then there is the people. Now, the people is not, um, you know, is, is, is made up of the the elites or the bourgeoisie or the aristocracy and the ordinary people. Now, the bourgeoisie, the aristocracy, they generally have lots of connections to the, the countries who are the puppet masters. And so, you know, we need to understand exactly what is happening. And, and for us to understand what is happening, we need to see more information coming out from the military to state exactly what is their agenda and how are they planning to actually restore civilian order because I do not support any military occupation of any description, because where the military occupies, the people have no power or say. We need to go back to civilian um, rule. And the question is, what is the agenda to actually restore democracy or restore civilian rule? Um, and we need to look at the constitution of the countries to see whether or not the constitutions, as they are, are able to satisfy, you know, to, to ensure that the people actually are in power because the people of Africa are, are not in power, right? And how can we essentially create constitutions, reevaluate the governance structures of these African countries to ensure that the people have a say in what is happening? Because now they are cannon fodder. You know, the people are the ones that generally suffer as a consequence of the coup d'etat because they initially you have all the hope and the euphoria you know, of, 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 of the revolution, but then in the end, it never really brings forth, you know, the, the, the actual benefit. So, so there's significant optimism right now because we're seeing leaders getting pushed to the side, rightfully, wrongfully, they need to go to the side. And now what happens next? And so we need to have a bit, little bit more information because we need to talk about the Sahel, as um, Dr. Eddie mentioned. The Sahel is a highly strategic, especially for, for um, you know, France. And so we now see lots of these countries are getting are frustrated with the military occupation of France, you know, because it's not just a case of military occupying, you know, you know, geographical locations, they have influence in, in, in exactly what happens in these countries, Absolutely. in terms of governance, in terms of policy. 
And, Afri and in these countries, there have been a dearth or a lack of sovereignty in terms of the ability of the population to express what they want, you know, and, and the government failing to, 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 to deliver these things. So I want to leave it there for the time being. Uh, quite amazing, uh, uh, Alice Clinton, for uh, the uh, uh, insight uh, uh, regarding our topic for discussion uh, today, uh, which are uh, military uh, takeovers across Africa. We are continuing to get your own perspective, uh, Mr. Elijah Enwako. Listening keenly to Mr. Elise, uh, I actually uh, picked out something uh, which I was of course going to, uh, for us to dissect in the course of the program, the agenda, what happens after the military coup. We know that the United Nations chief uh, and some uh, pundits have actually uh, 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 slammed military uh, takeovers, saying it's not uh, the ideal way to be able to call for reforms, but actually uh, some school of thought that still feel like it is a necessary evil, if I can put it this way. So now let's look at uh, military takeovers uh, in uh, being a catalyst of change, especially in uh, the 21st uh, uh, century. So in your perspective, uh, Mr. Elijah Enrico, do you see military takeovers as a catalyst of change, uh, maybe change in the political sphere, social and economic reforms as well? And of course, uh, this coup that has actually a catalyst that has actually pushed uh, for uh, civilian engagement in the affairs of the country. I know you're one of the people who have always been very intentional about uh, the leadership lapses across Africa and how this actually helping to derail Africa's, be it political or economic trajectory and the effect on the vibrant young people. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to give you a little bit of a historical perspective of what's happening in Africa because Having lived all my childhood in Africa, I, I think I feel the pinch of what's happening in Africa. So permit me to go a little bit into the struggles of the people of Africa. First and foremost, Africa is not allergic to democracy because there is this idea in the Western world thing that the people of Africa, they cannot manage democracy or democracy does not work in Africa or whatever it is. No. That is wrong and it's false. Africa is not allergic to democracy. Here is the problem. If you look at the coups that have taken place on the continent of Africa, if you look at that, I mean, in contemporary times, I don't want to go into 1960, 1970s. I just talk about the contemporary times. If you look at the coups that have taken place in Africa and you look at the root causes of those coups, you will understand the problems that are happening in Africa. Take from Guinea, where uh, uh, Alpha Conde decided to change the constitution and it brought about an uprising in that country. Or oh, you are talking about, maybe with the exception of Mali, where there were a problem of security, a mis uh, misunderstanding between the military and the government, or you're talking about Burkina Faso, but the rest of them, whether you're talking about Sudan, you're talking about Gabon, you're talking about uh, 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 Central African Republic, or you're talking about Chad, or you're talking about whichever that you might name. The problem has been, there has been a constitutional, a constitutional coup first. What do I mean by a constitutional coup? These are people that have decided to hold the countries hostage and the population have been helpless for a long time. And when they see a military leader come across and say, enough is enough, even though they might not agree with that military leader, or even though that might not be their aspiration at the time, they are looking for a way out. The way that the one that just happened in Gabon, this is a family that has ruled that country for 60 plus years, ladies and gentlemen. 60 plus years, one country that has held the country hostage for 60 plus years, I mean, a one family. Not only that, if you look at the population of Gabon, that is an all rich country that there should be no reason why anybody's poor in that country. We're talking about less than 3 million people with an oil reserve that places them, I think the fifth within the small OPEC nations. 
So we are talking about numbers. We are not just talking about you know, uh, abstracts. We are talking about numbers here and the effect on people. So there is no reason why anybody in that country should be poor. But yet we find one family that has held the country hostage and as all my colleagues have already said, becoming a puppet of a nation called France, which we all know, reporting to France, and the same nation France that has condemned the coup in Gabon does not find any problem with a military junta that has taken over in charge, does not find any problem with a constitutional coup that took place in Ivory Coast, and a man that came there and promised that he was not going to change the constitution decides to change the constitution and he wants to remain there in power. So we are talking about people that are fed up with presidents that do not represent their aspiration, people that have taken out a constitutional coup on the nation and held the nation hostage. So when there is, I put it in quote, a savior, when there is somebody that seems to, you know, see if you can ravage, I mean, uh, take control of the situation in the country and salvage whatever is left of the country, people will jubilate. People will jubilate because it's like, you know, uh, somebody who is drowning, even a snake comes your way, you're going to hold that snake because you are looking for a way to, you know, get yourself out of the water. That is what is happening in Africa. Again, the African Charter, the African Union Charter is not helping. If you read the articles of African Charter, African Union Charter, on coups and changing of constitution, it is so vague in such a way that they all condemn coups in Africa. If you look at the African, Charter, African Union Charter, there is an article, I can't remember what the article number is, they all condemn coups. But when it came to a time for the African Union to adopt a, a framework and a preamble on the changing of the constitution and to run for a third term. This is where it brought a problem. They could not agree among themselves. They now frame and say, if somebody changes the constitution within six months of a presidential election, that is where we condemn. Now it gave a leeway for these corrupt people to say, okay, since the African Charter say, if you change the constitution six months to the day of the election, we are going to do it one year or maybe two years ahead of time. Therefore, we're going to escape that article or the, 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 the trap that is laid by that article. And they have been successfully doing it in Africa. So these are the genesis. This is the genesis of some of the problems that we are facing in Africa. It's not that African people do not or they are allergic to democracy or they can't handle democracy. No, people are reacting to reality on the ground that nations have been taken hostage by puppet leaders who do not represent the aspirations of the people. And when anybody comes around that they seem to call a savior in quote, they will go with that person. It can be a snake, it can be a python, it can be somebody that will take over tomorrow and become a tyrant by himself, but the people are looking for a way out. That is the problem in Africa. Number two, it is true that, you know, military, take over, take the countries back backward. But if we have, ladies and gentlemen, if we will need a military leader in Africa, if it is a, it's going to take a military leader to come and say, hey, the agreement that we signed with France, the tax agreement that we signed with France, the mineral agreement that we signed with France, and all he will go through a litany of all those ones to say, we have to renegotiate all those contracts. We have to come to terms and make sure that we're having a fair shield. If a military leader is able to do that, and a civilian leader who has been there for two terms or whatever it is, is not able to do that, do you think the people are going to go with a civilian leader or a, 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 military, a, a military leader? Leadership, ladies and gentlemen, let's understand this. Leadership is not, if you're a leader and the people you're leading are not going together with you, you're just taking a walk in the park. If a military leader is going, able to take his people along the aspirations of the people, it doesn't matter that, well, it's true that, you know, it matters that he took uh, power through a coup d'etat, but if he's ruling according to the aspiration of the people, let me tell you, I'll shock some of you, I have no problem with that. 
Because what does it take? If you have a civilian leader that is representing the aspiration of a different country and not the aspiration of the people, and you have a cool leader that comes along and is representing the aspiration of people. As we speak today, it's just about four or five days that a coup d'etat took place in Gabon. But what has happened? They've arrested minister by minister. And what we are seeing on TV is that they are discovering bags upon bags upon bags of money that were stored in their houses. And they're recovering that money and putting it back into the state treasury. Do you think that the people are going to go along with the civilian leader or the coup leader? Who is doing the right thing here? So let's be honest with ourselves. It is true that nobody wants a coup, but if somebody comes along that's doing the right thing, people are going to go along with that person. And the people will continue to jubilate when a military leader comes up that seems to match the aspirations of the people. That is the problem in Africa. And I'm, as I'm telling you, we have authoritarian president in Africa that just recently reshuffled their military uh, 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 agendas and reshuffle and lay off some of them because they are afraid that is going to happen in their own country. So, ladies and gentlemen, the root cause of the problem is that we do not have presidents in Africa, especially in Francophone Africa, because the coups that have just recently taken place, apart from two, the rest are in Francophone Africa. That tells you that there's a problem. And not only that, the optics, if you look at the optics, I mean, France is a country that I don't know who is ruling that country and the, and the politics of that country. If you look at the optics, when this coup took place in Gabon and the coup that took place in Niger, French military council immediately met in order to examine what's happening there. How does a coup in Niger propagate a French military council to, to sit and examine what's happening? Is Niger a French country? I mean, a French colony? Is Gabon a French colony? The answer is yes, because if a French military council should meet because something's happening in a different country, that tells you, just looking at the optics, that country is just either a protectorate or a protectorate or a colony or whatever you might call of France. That is where the problem is. So let's lay the blame where the blame is. It's true that Africans need to take control of their country, but as we speak, these coups are just a reflection of the problems that are happening in that country. I will yield the microphone so that others can talk. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Elijah uh, Inaku. Uh, listening to all of the analysis presented uh, by you all regarding uh, our topic for discussion, does the We'll continue to analyze further uh, to bring in solutions, of course, on the analysis. We've identified some of the factors which have actually uh, uh, fueled these uh, uh, recent coups across uh, Africa. And of course, uh, I, I highlighted uh, some areas uh, when you were talking, uh, like white others, I identified some areas uh, which I want us to, as we continue with the program, uh, deliberate on uh, Dr. Eddie, I'm coming back to you. Now, we, we want to look at uh, these factors that uh, most of you have highlighted uh, about uh, the, the reason or being the, the root causes for uh, Africa's uh, uh, 21st century uh, cause. So I will take the, the issue of uh, accountability, transparency, and maybe a lack of fair representation and uh, others. So now, uh, uh, Dr. Eddie, looking at all of this, and uh, most especially the uh, non-respect of uh, constitutions, we know uh, this is one uh, reason that has actually exacerbated uh, coup d'etat in Africa, the constant change of constitution and uh, how the leadership that does not actually deliver to the expectations or the aspirations of the general public. But I always uh, accentuate that a debate program like this is not to blame. We blame and then we look for solutions. Now that we know what is happening, the areas of uh, accountability, transparency, fair representation, and uh, you can name the rest. How can we now reshape Africa's political scene? Because we cannot uh, actually deny that there's a political revolution across the continent of Africa. Now that it is there, and military uh, coups are already seeming to be one of, of the, the very practical ways to actually uh, bring back things into play. So in your perspective, what can be done 
in the contemporary globalized society for a better Africa. It's not just talking, but looking for practical solutions that will solve the problems of all Africans. Thank you, Clarice. Uh, before I uh, jump into this question, two points I want to make very quickly following my brother Elijah. He made a uh, strong uh, statement that I think I will uh, build on more and more and more. I agree with him when he said that, you know, uh, Africans are not allergic to democracy. And I think that's the point that we have to make because we have heard, you know, uh, uh, Euro-centered, you know, uh, 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 political pundits or as you call them, or uh, analysts uh, talking about, you know, uh, Africa is not a fit for democracy. Sheikh Antadiop, you know, uh, will not agree with that. When we look at our African traditional cultures, it is clear that elements of democracy existed in there. And I think, uh, Brother Elijah, that is a very strong point that, you know, what uh, you're making in there. Second thing, that I will call all my colleagues and maybe in the future uh, also to analyze. When we talk about you know, those things, we talk about geopolitics, as I said last time, geopolitics is also the language. For instance, when we talked about you know, some of the coups that we call constitutional coups, all of those coups are constitutional coups. The reason being that you have leaders who actually are using the uh, softer terms of constitutional coups to make it uh, different from any military takeover. But a military takeover is also an abridgment or uh, an infringement on the constitution. So all of them, I think as uh, uh, African-centered analysts, Pan-Africanists, if I can also use that term in there, we need to come up with a very good terminology that will recapture all of those coups, whether they are what we call constitutional by civilian regimes or by a military uh, takeover. This uh, will be another way, actually, Clarice, for me to answer your question about what do we do? One of the things that we have to do is the terms, again, that we use to describe the uh, political situation in Africa and the political uh, phenomenon that happened. Some leaders, when you look at them, Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, uh, the current uh, head of state in Cote d'Ivoire, is uh, quick and ready to mount a, a military intervention, pushing for that, you know, when it comes to Niger. But the question is, what is your own credibility? Second question is, and I'm glad that, you know, what the uh, 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 president, you know, in Nigeria has kind of uh, tampered a little bit, you know, his uh, first reaction in terms of military intervention in uh, uh, Niger to uh, bring, uh, depose, you know, uh, President Bazoum uh, back into uh, power. And now he's even uh, promoting the idea of a nine month uh, transition in Niger. But when you look at him also, look at the debacle of this. Uh, so expected Nigerian elections that took place in, 19, uh, in 2003, February past. Where is the legitimacy? And then when you talk about the president in Togo as well, how legitimate are you as a ruler in this echo was, for instance, to mount an army to intervene somewhere when we know that yourself came to power by what? Manipulation of the constitution in 2005 when your father died. So, Clarice, what needs to be done? And I'm going to enumerate them, you know, uh, in a, maybe uh, two minutes. Number one, how do we seize the moment? There are lessons to be learned from the past. Where do we get those, uh, do we get those lessons? As I said, Nigeria gave us at least a glimpse of an example in 1999 when General Abu Salami Abu Bakar took over. Nine months of a transition to set Nigeria on the course of some elections. Whether the system has improved till today, that's another question. We're going to ask the INEC, uh, the Independent uh, National Elections Commission of Nigeria, why the uh, February 2003 election failed. That's the thing. But at least we know that Nigeria has been every four years organizing some elections to uh, 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 designate you know, their leader. Second example that we can also build on in the past is the case of Ghana. Late President you know, Jerry Rawlings has ruled this country. But by 1992, he set the course that everybody is talking about today. So Nigerians, uh, Nigerian, uh, Gabonese, all of us in here need to go back in and sit down the same way we have studied the transition that was uh, instrumented in Benin, a pacific, calm, quietest transition that led the country to have a new prime minister, Monseigneur de Souza, and have uh, President Keruku in India. So there are lessons to learn from the past in Africa. But moving forward, moving forward, another thing that needs to be done, 
the civil society in Africa needs to master or flex its muscle more and more and be more intentional when it comes to civic engagement. Clarice, the reasons why, and all my colleagues have said it you know, earlier, but I'm just trying to say it in another word, we are seeing what we are seeing is because our political institutions are weak in reality. Not only they are weak, there is no clear separations of power, and you have an executive that can mount all that they can mount. And also the reason why people are, uh, the civil society is weak, is that we lack citizens. When people are impoverished, and you wait election to see uh, a candidate walking around with bags of rice. What do you expect, as uh, my brother Elijah said, for, from uh, people who are living in such you know, uh, uh, aspect of poverty, no clear access to you know, to health centers? What do you expect for them, from them? You can expect only for them not to follow in the trends that, that you have in, in there. So the civil society organizations need to really bring it in there. That's why worker unions, informal sector unions, uh, youth organizations, it is their moment to uh, rise up, to stand up in those different countries that are currently on the military coup in order to influence the current leaders in a way that the people will love. Again, I remember the 1990s when we talk about the National Day of Dialogue Days or National Transitional Days. There were opportunities for people to create this new space where not only people will speak, but also participate in the drafting of new constitutions. Last thing that I want to mention very quickly is the political behavior and what I call a, a, a cultural behavior. If we are where we are, Again, rehashing what a brother Elijah and others have said is because our political institutions are weak, but because the culture of stability is not well entrenched, not just in our institutions, but also in the ways in which people behave. Those things, I believe, are the areas where uh, uh, interventions you know, can uh, be uh, done to make sure that uh, in Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, 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 Niger now, Gabon, as we are seeing, whatever is behind, there is room, right, for the uh, African population. And here again, I'm going to insist on the civil society with all the elements that I mentioned before to play a role in influencing from within what uh, is happening in such a way that those uh, military transition can really lead to a period of uh, uh, stability, politically first, socially said, and then the economic aspect you know, will come uh, in in there. And that also goes into understanding clearly what are the implications of those changes that we are seeing with, uh, for the relationship that those countries are uh, having with external powers. We are talking about France. We're talking about you know, uh, the United States. We're talking about, you know, about Russia, even today, the BRICS countries. But we are also talking about the influence within the regional economic bodies, because that's another reshaping. ECOWAS and others are also being reshaped by what is uh, happening here. And Clarice, this is what I wanted to say in here in terms of uh, what can be done. Uh, and I'm sure that my colleagues you know, will uh, also uh, add on to that. Dr. Edi Eric, it's uh, how this uh, coup d'etat uh, will affect uh, not just uh, the external relationship uh, that Africa has uh, with other partners, but looking at how uh, this will actually affect, especially uh, uh, Africa's integration plan. You know, uh, over the years, uh, there uh, people have been actually jubilating that the historic continent of Richard area has gone uh, uh, into uh, its practical form, and uh, people were eager to see its full implementation. But then, uh, with the latest uh, revolution across the African continent, touching mostly the political sphere, there are many questions on how uh, uh, this will affect uh, the internal environment of the continent. Africa, be it uh, the political, economic, social, and you can name the rest. Uh, uh, let's let's write. Uh, continue with you, Mr. Arnold Dovely. You know, uh, when uh, Mr. Ellis was talking earlier on, he asked the question because 
he didn't share with uh, the uh, idea or maybe conform to military takeovers in a country without a clear agenda. Sir, I will want to direct his question to you because he actually asked, what next? What is the agenda? After the military takeover, how can a nation assure or ensure that there is a return to calm, stability, and normalcy? And if it's a civilian role, how can we bring in somebody that will work a role for the interest of the people? And while you're answering this question, the agenda, I also want to get your own perspective of the role of the international community, uh, actually the role they play in uh, supporting African countries in the uh, aftermath of uh, coup d'etat, particularly in the terms of uh, restoring stability and promoting democratic transitions. Yes, thank you, Clarice. Well, uh, to answer the first part of your question, I guess I can only echo what uh, Dr. Elijah was saying. Uh, of course, we would all like to assume that civilian uh, leadership is somewhat the most uh, presentable aspect of rule. But sometimes, and uh, history is uh, strong with uh, examples and precedents of uh, a great leaders, uh, particularly in Africa, issued from military ranks. Uh, whether it's uh, the late uh, Colonel Gaddafi, whether it's uh, a great independentist uh, such as Patrick Lumumba, Thomas Sankara, uh, it's just the issue that when it is about renegotiating the economic uh, re uh, distribution of the country's assets, obviously, uh, you know, this is where the uh, rubber meets the road. And uh, we've seen this times and times again with assassination attempt by the dozens, coup d'etat by the dozens. Uh, one of my colleagues was mentioning the Abongo family who has been ruling uh, this country for 60 plus years. I mean, it is, uh, you know, the uh, perfect example of, uh, you know, the uh, the anointed, you know, France Afrique uh, representative. Uh, and in Ivory Coast, we saw that as soon as Laurent Gbagbo started somehow deviating from the agreed upon script, uh, he was immediately uh, moved away and sent even to uh, the Hague for uh, uh, some uh, international crimes. Uh, we actually, unsurprisingly, now see his successor, uh, Alassane Ouattara, who's a product of uh, U.S. universities, uh, who is now one of the leading voices calling for uh, a uh, ECOVAS uh, 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 sponsored or disguised intervention to re-establish President Bazoum in Niger. So let's, no, let's make no mistake about it. Uh, whether it's civilian or uh, military rule is a force issue. The issue is how to somewhat have a uh, new leadership which is strong enough, uh, bold enough, and committed to basically turn the tables around, not uh, trade for one uh, outside influencer for another one, but to reset basically all the agreements. And we saw in Mali that this has already taken place with a, uh, a rewriting of the code of the mines. So that the mining industry may actually end up being more beneficial to the people of Mali. So this is in incremental through incremental uh, steps and concrete steps such as this one, that we will see the legitimacy of uh, eventually those new leaders. They may uh, eventually slowly but surely once stability is uh, established in terms of uh, economic redistribution, uh, and don't forget also that those colonial powers are not going to give up. Uh, one of my colleagues mentioned how France immediately held the two Conseil de Défense in the wake of uh, the Gabon coup and the Niger coup. Those people are not going away. Their uh, uh, status and their ranks in the international pecking order depends on it. So you can expect more uh, proxy terrorist groups being uh, deployed in the Sahel uh, region. Uh, trying to, what they did essentially in the Middle East, uh, create this kind of golem uh, like they did in Iraq with Daesh, and they will they will try to justify their presence. Let's not forget also about NATO, 
who is uh, now trying to build a base in Mauritania. So Africa is at the forefront of uh, any kind of attempt aimed at maintaining uh, the uh, not so uh, um, uh, balanced uh, economic redistribution accord. And uh, those, those interests are going to fight tooth and nails to make sure that nothing changes. So it is, to me, the most important thing is for the, those new leadership, to the extent they are really all sharing this uh, approach, which is, you know, we're going to basically do tabula rasa of everything that we've seen so far. I would suggest that they uh, create uh, interpenetration and they coordinate intelligence, military uh, assets, so as to better uh, confront what is most likely to be coming their way. Uh, this is, it's, they're going to have to kill in the egg any kind of attempt for those colonial powers to maintain their their positions on uh, in this region and on the continent at large. Dr. Devlin, thank you for your insight, uh, Mr. Ellis. Uh, let's continue with uh, with this question because I actually highlighted some areas or so key issues that we we can brainstorm on to be able to better understand. Uh, the, the effect, of course, of this uh, coup d'etat in contemporary Africa, uh, an Africa that is actually experiencing uh, a, a positive wind of change. So we want to look at now, still in respect to the international community, uh, what is the role of the international community in responding to, to this coup, including diplomatic initiatives, uh, sanctions, or military interventions? Mr. Ellis? Please, uh, your mic, Ms. Ellis. My apologies. Okay. The, firstly, the question that you addressed to Dr. Eddie, I'd like to add just something critically there in terms of what can be done in order to improve the circumstances on the ground. And we talk about constitution, but I would like to examine history for a second. Um, on the 27th of April, 1961, John Fitzgerald Kennedy made a speech, and the speech that he gave, I believe, was why he was assassinated, right? He, he, and I quote here, he says, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society, and we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to, to secret oaths, to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is a little value in opposing the threat of a close society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. And this is the last bit I would quote from him. He says, and there is very grave danger that an, un an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. If we do not examine history and understand where we're coming from, we will have no idea where we are going. As an engineer, I do root cause analysis in order to understand what exactly is happening that is preventing the will of the people from being manifested. And I want to add one part of the constitution when we have constitutional change in all of these countries in Africa. And this is that if you are a member of the Freemason or any, the Knights of Malta or any other of these institutions, you are automatically disqualified from being able to hold civilian office. And I repeat myself, if you are a member of the Freemason or any secret society, you are automatically disqualified in order to take civilian office. People need to understand the dangers of men, women sitting in secret rooms, making a gender on behalf of a people thousands of miles away. And I want to, to say this, that if you want to eliminate um, this, 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 this complete subversion of sovereignty that we see all throughout Africa and throughout the world, as a matter of fact, because there is no sovereignty or, or, or democracy in America. If you examine the, the, the data that is coming out 
of, of Georgia and, and um, some of the other states, you'll see that there were manipulation of even the votes. And so, of course, you know, we do not have democracy anywhere. And the question is, why is this the case? Why did JFK die about a year and a half subsequent to making the speech? And of course, Eisenhower um, that came before him also warned about the military industrial complex. The military industrial complex are manned by individuals that are coming out of the Freemason, skull and bones, and all of these very nefarious societies, and they do not represent the interest of the people. You have even political leaders that have admitted in the past that they do not, they, they do not take their agenda from the people who voted them into power, allegedly, right? They are taking their agenda from somebody else. And one of the points that um, Mr. Devely mentioned about um, it is true that being a democratic leader doesn't automatically make you a good leader and that you can have potentially good dictatorships. However, we cannot and we should not condone the idea of dictatorships at all. This should be an absolute no. Yes, Gaddafi was was a, was a, was a, was was bringing forth good agenda, and of course he challenged the status quo. And it was let's not forget it was Sarkozy that championed that he should be removed because he wanted to bring forth the gold back dinar, and the gold back dinar would have been a significant threat um, to the the the, the fiat CFA franc that exists in 15 African countries today. So it is about the money. It is about the ability to be able to um, ensure that the wealth of the country gets transferred down from the elite, the bourgeoisie, from the aristocracy that exists down to the people. And a part of the significant, and the problem of this is the fact that the governments that are put in power, whether dictatorships, because the West has no problem with dictatorships, it's whether these dictatorships have been made in their own image. And if they have been made in their own image, they have no problem because they will carry out and facilitate their own agenda. And therefore, they, they will keep them and say, okay, fine, this dictatorship is good and this one is bad. And so, you know, Saddam Hussein, for example, let's not forget that it's only, it's, it's almost, it was 2003, so 20 years ago, that we saw the Iraq invasion on false pretext of weapons of mass destruction, right? Because yeah. Saddam Hussein decided that he, he would not um, continue to use the dollar. So if we want to understand how we should go about implementing policy um, you know, to, to ensure that we are moving towards uh, a civilian rule that supports the interest of the people, we have to eliminate and add to the constitution that each individual that wants to um, abide in, um, in, in, uh, in, in, in to take civilian Take civilian take a position as a as a, as a as a civil servant. You cannot. You should not be a member of any secret society. And I'll just leave it there. So much. Just to remind uh, those of you tuning in that uh, this is the Pan African Debate on African Media Television, where we talk constructively analyzing uh, the happenings across Africa and also looking at Africa's relation with the rest of the world and how this uh, can uh, be used positively to foster change or positive change across the continent Africa. Uh, Yulia Burke just uh, join us. Uh, she's a political analyst. Hello to you, Yulia, and welcome. And of course, we were analyzing uh, recent uh, developments across uh, Africa and, uh, of course, in the areas of uh, coup d'etat. Uh, uh, given what has been said already, I will actually uh, direct uh, this uh, question to you. Uh, we are looking at, because some people actually uh, of the viewpoint that military uh, takeovers are not actually good because uh, the, they have uh, uh, effects which are not very healthy for a country. So now, looking at all that is happening, the revolution across Africa, what are those uh, preventive measures that can be uh, maybe taken domestically and internationally? to address the root causes of uh, coups across Africa? Um, well, and there are several points to make here, I think. Uh, number one, we're definitely uh, in the uh, global transformation. 
So it means that uh, the system that uh, still exists right now will not be functional in just a few years. And it's quite clear to everyone because the system has come to that critical point when uh, it, it has become way too corrupt and it's uh, too obvious that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the things happening in uh, geopolitics and economics are just absurd, right? So we're now living in this, uh, not just the, um, what used to be called several years ago, the post-truth, uh, you know, societies and order, uh, but now it's more like an absurd theater when it seems that, uh, you know, the global... Uh, uh, rules and regulations and the way um, the geopolitics are functioning is just a parody uh, on itself, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's number one. And we need to just admit uh, the fact that the global transformation is happening. And due to this fact, there will be a lot of changes at the um, international level, at the local level, and pretty much everywhere, right? So at the moment, the old system is dying off and uh, the new system is not there yet. It's just starting to take shape and it's not even clear what it would be looking like. So there are two options of how this could happen. This could happen in a slow evolutionary way which would be smooth and humane and slowly but surely societies, countries would be moving towards uh, a new set of regulations, a new understanding of not just coexistence, but of a functional um, regional or international system. And option number two is to shake things up and make it happen in quite a fast way. Yet, so that would be violent. So that would imply uh, a certain uh, period of chaos. So that would imply that no immediate improvements would be made. And moreover, first thing, things would get much worse. And then once... Uh, when this, once this uh, tower, let's say, is ruined, um, using the uh, the very same foundation, something new would be built. But uh, of course, uh, I, uh, well, in, in in my opinion, at least, uh, the optional scenario is a so-called fast-forwarded evolution, right? That would not require, um, you know, blood being spilled and uh, many. Um, sufferings of you know millions if not billions of people yet it is only possible if uh, you know certain factors and conditions come together so what we're seeing now in Africa after uh, after this new wave of pan-Africanism uh, after this new wave of uh, anti neocolonial movement um, uh, have taken place is that um, people that were and different, uh, let's say, politicians, uh, philosophers, uh, elite groups, they realize that the way it used to function is just not going to be functional anymore, right? Uh, but at the same time, we need to understand that the uh, the existing system, including all of the various uh, neocolonial practices, is so very deeply rooted into societies, and uh, it has to do with... Uh, uh, with the basic uh, needs of human beings, right? Because the way a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, elites or political leaders are being controlled is through their uh, possessions, financial, re financial uh, resources, through their children, uh, through um, a lot of other things that have to do with human being instincts, right? It's something very strong, something, the strings that could be easily pulled. And uh, it's just, you know, designed to be that way. So unfortunately, I think we will be seeing a lot of uh, this kind of escalations happening. And it's the very same, let's say, war or the very same clash uh, that we see happening in Eastern Europe uh, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, which is just a proxy in, in the, uh, um, you know, uh, let's say, war of uh, Russia and uh, the West, uh, if we can uh, call it so. So uh, it's the very same thing and uh, it would definitely take uh, time and uh, unfortunately it would probably take uh, um, you know some lives or it would take a crisis you know to it would it would take uh, some major crisis to uh, you know overcome this and to figure out what a more functional way of interaction would be looking like because uh, what's uh, Mm, what's seen now, again, I would repeat that, uh, it's quite an absurd theater when any person with a common sense understands that it's just not uh, sustainable. 
Okay, thank you for that, uh, uh, dear Yulia. And uh, I think we'll run off the first uh, topic with you, Mr. Elijah uh, Enwaku, uh, of course, the topic on uh, coup d'etat. So in your perspective, given what is happening across Africa now, uh, what can, well, what advice can you uh, give to the military already in control on how they can actually uh, 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 work because you know that uh, the, some of these countries actually witnessing coup d'etat uh, have been uh, placed under the African Union sanctions and, and we see also some part of the international community uh, reacting uh, uh, to the, uh, the, the, the latest development in Gabon and elsewhere. So what is the, the, the solution for the military to actually uh, redefine the uh, the political scene in uh, these African countries that have witnessed uh, this revolution and uh, military takeovers to ensure uh, that they do not uh, repeat uh, the mistakes of predecessors. Uh, you know, some countries that, that have witnessed some uh, coup d'etat uh, today without a former uh, government. And of course, we also know that political wrangling or wrangling after a coup d'etat is also an aspect of uh, that will breed uh, instability uh, in any country. So what do, do you have to say? What, can, what is the take home <coughs> message? Uh, yes, Clarice, uh, let me begin by saying this. Um, first and foremost, what is happening, especially in Francophone Africa, it's simply saying the status quo is not sustainable it's not acceptable, not continue. That is what, that is the direct message that this military takeover is saying. Again, the status quo, what currently exists as we know it, will not continue. Number two, what would have happened, Clarice, and ladies and gentlemen, and everybody listening to us is that, if we have regional blocks, international community constitution of regional blocks, that have the autonomy and the legitimacy, they would have been able to contain this and bring this under control. But the problem is that the international community that is supposed to handle these kind of things does not by itself has the legitimacy to go in there and do anything. Number, for example, let's take the Semag region where Gabon, for example, belongs. The Semag region constitutes of Cameroon, Gabon, uh, Chad, Congo, Brazzaville, Equatorial Guinea, and Central African Republic. Each of these countries has changed its constitution to make it possible for the incumbent to rule almost indefinitely. So number one, none of these countries have has the moral authority to go in there and say, let's condemn this country, let's make sure that civilian rule is instituted or given or uh, reinstituted because they themselves are going through a similar quagmire and a mess. Number two, from a security perspective, none of these countries has the security apparatus and the ability to go in there and do anything like what ECOWAS is trying to do. Why? If you look at Cameroon, Cameroon is facing the crisis in the north with Boko Haram and they are not able to contain that. They're facing the crisis in the Northwest and the Southwest with Ambazonia rebels. They are not able to contain that. If you look at Chad, Chad is going through a routing, a very difficult situation right now. And they're not able to agree among themselves on when the next election should stand. You have the, uh, the son of the former president holding on tight to power. So from a security perspective, that country itself has nothing to offer. You look at Congo Brazzaville, is the same thing, changing of constitution and political instability going on in that country. If you look at Central African Republic, a couple of weeks ago, we heard it. They did a referendum and they changed their constitution, giving uh, the president of that country almost unlimited terms of him to run to power. If you look at Equatorial Guinea, they did the same. They changed their constitution and Otwajera Obiangemba can rule as long as he can. So none of the countries in the Semag region that make up the regional bloc has the moral authority, political authority, security apparatus 
to do anything on what is happening. On the contrary, if you look at ECOWAS, which is another regional block, ECOWAS that is being controlled or being manned by Nigeria and all of us, teleguided by Nigeria, wanted to intervene. But what stopped them? Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea, they gang up together and they said, hey, look here, if you intervene in Niger, we are going to be on the path. We are going to back the junta. We're going to come in and fight you. So what that tells me that those three countries are able to stand up to some sort of imperialism. Other countries coming in there. So what I'm trying to explain here is the fact that if you have countries that have the regional autonomy and the independence and the capacity to stand against imperialism, some of these things will stop. But as we speak, they do not. They do not. And unfortunately, as we speak today, I know people say we shouldn't blame, but we know where the problem is coming from. France, just a couple of days ago, had a meeting with Emmanuel Macron, and Macron said, this issue of limitation of third terms, it's, you know, I can't use the, the term he used on TV, he says BS. If their own imperial master does not see any reason, does not see any cause, or does not see any problem with prolongation of terms, changing of constitution, being there forever, then that tells you where the problem is coming from. So again, African countries, it is not the problem of uh, coup d'etat. If we have a benevolent, you know, it's unfortunate for me to say it, but that's the truth. If we have a benevolent despot that comes there, meet the aspirations of the people, rule according to the aspiration of the people. We have military leaders in, in, in Mali today that are going after contract by contract with the Western power and said, this has to be renegotiated. We have military leaders that are cursing alliance with the imperial master. We have military leaders that are changing the geopolitical atmosphere by going into South-South corporations with the other countries that they can now use that as a bone of contention to resist this imperialist NATO North American-led multi-industrial uh, uh, complex that can withstand that. That is one thing we're shaping. Mr. Devile said something, which I want to echo what he said. The truth is that these imperial powers are not going to give up easily. Let's not kid ourselves here. They are not going to give up easily. I already told you guys that when this coup took place in Niger, even in Gabon, the French military council met to examine the situation. That tells you the gravity of what they're going to lose if this country get out of their column, of that column of imperialism. So if African countries, those regional blocs, can't really have the autonomy that they desire or they should have and can be able to stand up, gang up together, stand up against imperialism, I am telling you that's the way to go. It's true that, you know, military takeovers, it's not what anybody desires. It is not the ideal. But if they are the way that Africa is going to use to shake the status quo, I am telling, I will shock some of you that I have no problem with that. As long as we're not sharing blood and destroying property and killing people, if that is going to take military coup d'etat to shake the status quo that exists in Africa and dismantle this imperialism, and make sure that we do not return to the old order. It is a shocking thing that a group of countries, more than 15 of them, have their currency being named and controlled by one single country. And we are here talking about, oh, military leaders should not take over whatever it is. I don't care. As long as these people are able to break this French hegemony of Francophone Africa, if it is going to take military leadership to do it, I'll go for it. Inoko, of course, it's about uh, working for the interest of uh, the uh, population. You, you know, some point it's always if a leader is there, but then meeting the aspirations of the people and uh, there is employment and everybody, the, the living standard actually, especially yeah, of uh, uh, the common man is actually commendable, uh, then the leadership is one that can be promoted, uh, the viewpoint of some people. Uh, just to tell you uh, that, uh, uh, televiewers, uh, we are concluding the first uh, uh, 
uh, topic. I know there's still a lot to talk about, but subsequently, yeah, uh, we are going to continue analyzing in our subsequent uh, programs and uh, time for us to dive to the second uh, topic, uh, which is uh, taking focus on the uh, regional elections uh, that will be holding in Russia, you know, uh, for, for a while now, the Russia-Ukraine uh, 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 crisis have been actually uh, making waves, and of course, the effect of such uh, we see <coughs> in uh, September 2022, uh, there was a referendum where we see, uh, saw, I beg your pardon, saw uh, uh, citizens of, of some regions uh, voting uh, overwhelmingly uh, to join uh, the Russian Federation, and to, uh, it is worth noting uh, that uh, this uh, September 2023 uh, regional elections will be held in this uh, Occupy regions of Donetsk, Kherson, Luhan, and uh, Zaporizhia. Uh, that is the occupied uh, areas, and which will hold this September in Russia. And uh, according to some pundit, this election uh, come or aims uh, to bring about uh, stability and restore a sense of self-governance to the local population. And of course, it therefore represents a special event uh, in uh, Russia. So let's kick off this with you, Yulia Burke. What do you have to say about the regional elections in these uh, occupied regions? Of course, what are the expectations as the days for the vote are drawing closer? Well, I would say that the key expectation from this um, uh, from this event, uh, the regional elections uh, in those um, territories. Uh, that would be definitely answering the question if those territories are occupied or liberated. Mm -hmm. And that is the core of what is happening there at the moment, because basically, if you look at it at the uh, bigger picture, what you see is that, uh, uh, well, basically, Ukraine is what uh, Russia could have been if that was under uh, major colonial pressure, right? Because the agenda, uh, the way it was being implemented, the mechanisms uh, through which uh, the regime was changed back in 2014 in Ukraine, uh, they all show the typical uh, handbook um, of, uh, you know, well, generally speaking, the West and the global elites. So um, uh, that was uh, exactly the reason uh, why uh, the conflict uh, uh, broke out uh, back in 2014 and uh, the happenings of uh, 2022, which is the beginning of the uh, Russian special military operation, was a consequence of the fact that the Minsk agreements uh, were not uh, followed and uh, the documents that were signed uh, by the representatives of Ukraine and it was uh, supposed to be supervised by the four uh, by the four leaders of uh, European countries, nothing was happening. And we already saw those leaders admitting, admitting that the Minsk agreements were only signed uh, to give more time to the uh, military industrial complex of the West to supply uh, Ukraine with weapons and to fuel this uh, war between uh, basically, you know, very um, close uh, people, right? I mean, the, uh, the people of Ukraine and Russia uh, and it's not just something cultural, but it's uh, something that uh, can be proved by the fact uh, that many have relatives in those two countries and it's hard to separate the two into two peoples, right? So uh, the key question that would be answered during this happening is uh, again, if those territories were occupied or liberated, which is uh, brought back to, uh, to the uh, let's say governance system and which is more important the value system the cultural system that is closer to the people but again here we need to consider that it's an active war zone in all of those and uh, people would be uh, trying to both organize and take part in the election which is to vote um, literally speaking under the bullets and with constant shellings that have never stopped in some of those regions since 2014. So um, it's been nine years of the conflict. Um, there were different approaches used. Uh, last year, there was the referendum according to which uh, people chose to uh, uh, to join the uh, Russian Federation. But it's clear that, uh, and I think it's one of the most important things, uh, you know, that regardless of uh, 
regardless of um, uh, you know what's uh, what's happening around the the key uh, thing that people need is basic security, basic stability, and making sure that uh, you know they can uh, live their life uh, in a calm and peaceful way, right? So. Uh, we will see people voting and sharing their um, their views on how they see it um, even possible. Thank you for that, uh, Dia Ilya. Talking about the peace and stability, uh, let me come to you, uh, Mr. Arnold uh, Davli. Uh, you've listened, or we've listened uh, uh, keenly to you, Ilya, but the, the question is now, how do you think uh, uh, these uh, regional elections uh, will go a long way uh, to contribute to this greater uh, stability and peace in the areas, uh, given that, uh, because uh, from the last referendum that was conducted in uh, 2022, uh, precisely in September, we saw also a report from uh, mainstream ma media platforms actually calling it a sham and actually uh, saying Russia uh, manipulated uh, the uh, population in these uh, areas and of course. So now, uh, what can you say? How will these uh, regional elections make a difference and actually uh, bring to light the realities on ground? Yulia you know, talked about uh, knowing whether it's still an occupied territory or a liberated territory. Yes, thank you, Clarice. Well, first of all, let us uh, inform our viewers and listeners that um, uh, there is indeed those uh, uh, regional elections that were supposed to be, for most of them, they are supposed to be held on a single day on the 10th of September. But owing to security reasons in the uh, new uh, subject of the Russian Federation, uh, which are the, you know, the two popular republics of Donetsk uh, and uh, Luhansk and the uh, regions of Kherson and Zaporozhye, uh, the uh, uh, vote actually started uh, on Thursday, this past Thursday. Mm -hmm. So obviously for uh, security reason and, and logistics, uh, aiming to make sure that, uh, you know, everybody gets the chance to express their desire to see such and such candidate mm -hmm. uh, represent them. Uh, I think uh, Yulia summed it all up pretty well. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, you make a good point when you said that the mainstream media uh, will try to undermine the legitimacy of the vote as they attempted to do so last year. But what else was supposed to be done? Uh, allow those people to remain in legal limbo uh, when we know that uh, their own court and of court government in Kiev uh, essentially, uh, and if we go by what Poroshenko said back in 2015, uh, declared them as enemy of the state, uh, and that the Minsk Accord basically contained uh, all the ingredients to come to a, a solution which would have seen those provinces and republics remain in Ukraine, albeit uh, under some kind of uh, autonomous uh, status, mm -hmm. and that as we as we saw and as uh, Yulia uh, uh, underlined. Uh, we know now that the whole Minsk Accord was a uh, charade and that it was all about gaining time uh, to make sure that force would be used and uh, the will of those populations would be reduced. So we know what happened and uh, the Russian Federation, in that sense, uh, through the special military operation, uh, is the only party that's somewhat abided by the Minsk Accord, uh, I mean, owing to its obligation. Uh, which basically uh, in its annex, uh, annex to Resolution 2202, which crystallized the uh, Minsk Accord at the UN Security Council, called for every party jointly or individually do its utmost to see that the Minsk Accord uh, successfully uh, uh, were implemented. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, the special military operation is uh, a direct extension of uh, that will to see that the uh, fundamental objective of the Minsk Accord, as they were initially envisioned, uh, were to be respected, which is to maintain the physical integrity of the local population, mm -hmm. see that uh, their cultural and linguistic right be respected, and, uh, you know, I guess come up to some kind of solution if then there is no will for autonomy owing to the uh, absence of goodwill from the other partners 
to this uh, process, uh, the uh, only option left was to provide for a legal way out for those local population to express themselves. And so once everything is said and done in that particular context, what we are going to be seeing, uh, as we started seeing on the, on the 31st of August, and which will be uh, uh, continuing, I guess, uh, all the way to the tents, tents included, I would assume, is whether or not uh, uh, this uh, this will that was expressed last in last year's referenda uh, will be uh, uh, underlined as having uh, been you know what people really thought at the time, and we can we can assume that this will be the case because obviously uh, those people are now you know yes they are in war zones I mean but we're talking about eighty percent of the four regions on the whole you know being pretty much under uh, the Russian Federation control. So we're not dealing with a uh, 60 to 40 percent, you know, not far from it. Uh, construction has taken place, infrastructure are being rebuilt, uh, security, which is a fundamental right under the uh, UN Charter, uh, you know, and security of the person, right to live, uh, has been reinforced, reified, and people are going to their own lives by and large, except for you know some uh, particular areas, but uh, you know. There's, there's a sense of normalcy coming in and a sense of hope. And most importantly, there is a legal certainty, legal security as to uh, the future uh, of those people uh, as a administrative, political administrative unit. They belong now. They are new subject, again, of the Russian Federation. And uh, uh, they intend to uh, uh, confirm and uh, uh, reiterate their willingness to uh, be perceived as such. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Ernold Dublin. Uh, continuing in the same light with you, Mr. Ellis, uh, Clinton Ellis, uh, you've been following up uh, keenly the development across uh, Russia and Ukraine, and of course uh, with the uh, elections uh, which are ongoing. Now the question is, uh, do you think uh, uh, we are looking at uh, the, the, the elections in the occupied uh, regions, so do you think this can uh, actually check the situation between uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine? Uh, can these elections serve as uh, a catalyst or uh, uh, that will actually f f fast track the resolution of, of the, the flare existing between the two countries? Uh, I don't think so. I think that um, the, the forces that are behind um, Ukraine in supporting the war against Russia, they do not really want to have peace there. You know, um, if they wanted to have peace, they would have signed the Minsk Agreement from the beginning. It, we must be reminded um, and I'll remind the audience um, that um, it was essentially a coup d'etat um, that uh, removed the government of Viktor Yanukovych, who was, you know, more or less in a in a, in a, a positive relationship with Russia, and uh, this positive relationship with Russia, um, it was not to the liking of certain international um, forces. And so they had a coup d'etat, and then they installed the the, the Yatsunuk, Turchinov government, if you remember, that's before Poroshenko. Um, and uh, if you remember, it was the so-called Azov battalion that became an Azov regiment, who is made up of Nazis that insisted um, that the Minsk agreement was not acceptable because it would have allowed for constitutional reform that would have allowed for um, the, the, the people of Donetsk and Luhansk to um, vote to become essentially autonomous or semi-autonomous from Kiev. And it is this clause within the Minsk agreement that was not accepted by the Azov. And so the, the forces behind um, you know, this perpetual, this war that we see taking place today that's left unresolved. It, they do not accept the vote or the right of self-determination as in, you know, which is, which is number one of the UN Charter, you know, that every people have the right to determine. Um, and what self-determination means is today, if we want to be friends with Russia, we can be friends with Russia. If we want to be friends with anybody else, we can be friends with anybody else. 
And that is why it's so important to have a constitution and a constitution that represents the will of the people in the sense that not just for short-term stability, but for long-term stability, not just for two terms or three terms, but as time goes to infinity, does this charter, the document that is called the constitution, will it essentially um, support stability in perpetuity? And this is really a question that I still, you know, um, I, I, I wrestle with because that's why I'm so against the idea of coup d'etats and military rule because you may have one good dictatorship, but then you know, when the, once that one person goes, what's going to happen in 10 years or 20 years? We go back to the same problem again. And so we have to remember where we're coming from with respect to what happened in Ukraine and to understand the parties and the chess pieces on, the, on this geopolitical chessboard and to realize that they do not really want peace. You know, they do not want to negotiate because had they wanted to negotiate, they would have signed the Minsk Agreement. And so I do not believe that these um, elections will change the situation on the ground because um, if, if you look on the amount of money and, and armament that are being provided um, to Ukraine, to Kiev, by Britain, by, you know, even now Scandinavia is involved, you know, um, so you can see that they do not really um, want peace. So I do not think that these elections will change in the circumstance on the ground. Uh, problematic that, that lies too. Uh, so how can, uh, of course, uh, the elections be utilized as a, 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 a strengthening force, uh, or a force to strengthen the cooperation that and collaboration between uh, the uh, th these regions and, of course, uh, the neighboring areas to make the people stand as uh, to understand the realities and, of course, choose the side of peace, like uh, Mr. Arnold Dudley highlighted uh, in his analysis. Uh, uh, Russia going the legal way to, to, to actually give a voice uh, to the population of this region. So, are these elections uh, uh, at all to uh, ensure? Uh, more cooperation or to strengthen cooperation and collaboration between these regions which are seemingly volatile and uh, their neighboring areas. To you, Mr. Ellis. Um, you know, it, of course, it will be a moral boost, you know, and, and it would be a document to show the international community that indeed the people have made a choice and that they want to be a part of Russia. Um, and of course, what Yulia mentioned before is that the people of the Nesk Luhans in this area and, 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 in, and in Crimea, they are effectively Russians. And, um, you know, this fact seems to be, um, is being um, completely ignored by the international community. You know, that um, the, 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 these people are family. And so, you know, there is a certain amount of sensitivity um, in, in understanding that families can have conflict, and but you need um, a party, you know, on the ground who's able to bring both parties together to sit at the table and to negotiate agreement. But this was done already. Um, it was done in the form of the Minsk Agreement, mm -hmm. and um, and so all the international community they simply did not agree because there is no spirit of cooperation that exists. So you know. Um, it will, of course, boost Russia's legitimacy in terms of the military, special military operation that is taking place okay. um, there and, um, you know, to, to, to boost, you know, the will of the Russian government, you know, not to give in um, to the, the, the very outlandish behavior that we've seen coming out of, um, you know, the so-called international community and NATO, let's call it NATO, yeah. um, that they, and, and I want to also look carefully at the people behind Ukraine. Now it's come out in uh, the US how corrupt the Biden um, administration is with Hunter Biden. And the fact that, um, you know, with this his relationship with Burisma and that this, the son of Nancy Pelosi, Paul Pelosi, and, this, and, and Mitt Romney's son, they were all a part of the, the, the Ukrainian government. You know, um, so many dual citizenships were permitted whereby you had Americans sitting there in the Rada and making decisions. So you can see that there, the situation is so complicated and um, that the, 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 uh, so much blood and treasure 
of the Ukrainian people have been invested, and the Russians, as a matter of fact, in, in pushing this, this war um, that is not leading anywhere good. And it's now time, you know, obviously it's been time, a long time ago, for us to essentially move, you know, towards rapprochement, towards some kind of peace. But obviously, you know, there is no spirit that exists that actually wants peace. You can see that they've removed Russia completely, you know, from the SWIFT and have sanctioned almost all the Russian corporations. Yeah. So there is really no spirit behind, um, you know, NATO, you know, to want to essentially accept the, even this vote that is coming out of, um, you know, Eastern Ukraine or, or the Donbass. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we are rounding off with you, Mr. Arnold uh, Dudley. Uh, looking at the situation on the ground, and of course, uh, uh, the fact that if uh, uh, a population can be voting already uh, to join uh, the uh, Russian Federation, it is an indication that uh, they are actually uh, fed up with uh, how things are uh, uh, turning up there in uh, Ukraine uh, regarding the leadership's uh, way of handling uh, the situation which actually the third party is actually uh, engulfed. So uh, uh, what do you think, uh, again, uh, as we are concluding uh, this uh, program, uh, so what opportunity uh, uh, does this election present? not just for Russia, not just uh, for, for, but now to the international uh, 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 community, what can be learned uh, regarding the stance by Russia? We mentioned uh, the, the, the aim of, of course, uh, bringing uh, an election that will inculcate uh, uh, a people that seems to be isolated and of course uh, putting into consideration their rights and also bringing representatives that can listen uh, to their uh, plea, uh, of course, uh, and also have their, their stay uh, or say in uh, the, uh, uh, the way things are being uh, run around them. So, Holistically and conclusively, uh, what can we make and what are the greater expectations of this? Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, echo uh, Dr. Ellis' uh, uh, comments bearing on the fact that no matter what uh, process is being implemented, um, owing to you know the uh, idea which is, you know, let's see what those people want to do where do they you know belong uh, if they don't belong into some kind of negotiated agreement within the minsk accord framework uh you know then uh, where should where should they go obviously russia decided that you know uh, enough was enough and they provided uh, the legal framework for them to express their their willingness to uh rejoin the russian federation uh, all this could have been avoided uh but effect you know and i agree Unfortunately, and you know, uh, holistically, unfortunately, uh, I would say that uh, everything that will be uh, uh, endeavored by the Russian Federation to, legally speaking, and and the Russian government is a lot of things, and they're especially legalist. Uh, they believe that the charter might not be the best, uh, 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 an ideal document. That's the only one we have. And so, you know, owing to those general principles of law and owing to the uh, technical uh, application of those principles uh, to the uh, situation at issue, uh, Russia did the only thing it could within the framework that allowed it to do so. Uh, the problem is, as Dr. Ellis uh, correctly mentioned, uh, we have uh, witnessed a system of external management in Ukraine Ukraine is not an independent state, so this is a premise that should be uh, incorporated into any kind of analysis to, you know, before anything else is looked into. And uh, as it turns out, the uh, entire American political establishment uh, has personal stakes in this remaining uh, the case. Uh, and they understand that if uh, officially Ukraine was to lose that conflict, all those conflicts of interest and all those uh, instances of external management would come to light. And one can wager that not only their political career would be over, but uh, they would most likely be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. 
So this is more than just a objectively neutral uh, analysis, a rational as analysis based game here. We're talking about an entire American political class that is running out and you know, running for its life. And we see it uh, in the instance that there is no peace negotiation or no, any kind of uh, remotely any kind of uh, indication that uh, we are heading to a an appeasement or some kind of uh, a, a rapprochement or a detente or some kind of uh, winding down off ramp, whatever you want to call it on the outside, but also on the inside when, as we near the 2024 presidential uh, presidential sweepstakes in America, uh, the putative uh, GOP nominee, which happens to be running away with the nomination, uh, even though the election campaign hasn't started yet, but who uh, expressly stated that he would put a term to this uh, Ukraine uh, situation if he was to be elected, uh, represents, you know, uh, such a threat that uh, everything, uh, every trick in the book is being pulled to try to disqualify him from running. Uh, and, and, and the more they actually go out of their way to do so, the more he becomes popular. So uh, now we are really getting into dangerous territory because what is the next step? Are they going to resort to political violence, the likes of what we saw with JFK? And this actually will somewhat you know connect with what dr hillis was saying earlier is that there are interests in the united states which represent anything but the popular will and we do not care a bit about uh, international security to the extent they can keep the uh, control over the levers of government and uh, uh, line up their pockets okay thank you so much uh, mr Devley, and of course your your analysis brings us to the end of today's program, the Pan-African Debate. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge you and the other panelists for the greater insight as we continue to give our own perspective uh, regarding uh, world's uh, development, world issues. Et aujourd'hui, les avocats course, de Sylvia l'épouse Franco. I want to also thank uh, uh, the technicians for ensuring that we had a successful uh, program and uh, uh, just to remind our viewers uh, that uh, African media is not out to spread uh, propaganda as it is being said, but uh, we, are, we are here to have a constructive and an in-depth uh, in depth analysis of uh, the happenings across uh, the global world, of course, uh, uh, taking the African perspective and how Africa uh, faces uh, with the changes occurring in the global stage uh, where we see uh, the, the need for a new world order. As Yulia highlight, highlighted earlier, uh, there is a, a global transformation and to be able uh, to understand this, we need to move with the transformation, pick what is good and what will help to continue to foster uh, the development of our countries while respecting uh, the, the role of humanity and of course uh, letting the voices of the voiceless heard across the globe. Thank you so much for always trusting the Pan-African Television. I wish you a wonderful weekend all, but do remember that Africa Media is here, and of course, do have a lovely moment in the company of our transmissions. Bye-bye, and see you some other time.